Good morning, everybody. Hey, glad, you, glad you're here. I just want to draw your attention once again to our, our screen. We're going to be looking at some, some quick teaching from Pastor Robert Morris, uh, the author of a great book called The Blessed Life. And it, The Blessed Life focuses on giving and on the, on the scriptural foundations for tithing. And what he's talking about today is that tithing is a test, and he's interacting with these verses in Malachi chapter 3 that say, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be room enough to store well, there will not be room enough to store it. And I will I will drive back the devourer. So check it out. See what he has to say. Tithing is a test. See, God is testing our hearts. Even when a person argues about tithing, I think to myself, what is the spirit behind this? Why would this person argue when God gave his son for you and you won't even give him 10%? Why would you argue about this? It's amazing to me. I'm telling you, it's a test of your heart. It's a test. Now, uh, here's why I believe uh, he chose 10%. By the way, the word tithe uh, is a Hebrew word. Uh, Ma'asra is the Hebrew word. And it means tenth part or ten percent. Tenth part. Tenth. Okay, so that's where we we get this from, that we know it's ten percent. Here's why I think he chose ten percent. First of all, I think he chose a percentage because it's fair to everyone. It doesn't matter if you make 30,000 or 300,000. It's a penny on every dime. It's the same for every person. Uh, But here's the reason I think he chose 10. Because for some reason, many times when you see the number 10 in the Bible, it represents testing. You'll actually see the word test with it. Uh, For instance, let's let's take a little test, all right? I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to answer me uh, out loud. Uh, All the campuses, all the churches, just say your answer out loud, all right? Here's the first question. How many plagues were there in Egypt? Ten, Ten, right? Now, I could have said it a different way. I could have said, how many times did God test Pharaoh's heart? Because that's what he did. But we're familiar with how many plagues there were. All right? Here's the second question. How many commandments are there? Ten. Ten, okay? Um, Now, I'm going to ask another question, and you might not know this, but there's a a pattern (laughs) here, okay? And this is in Numbers 14 where God actually says this. You can read it later, all right? But, and then I want you to say your answer just a little louder, okay? Uh, how many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? Ten. That's correct. All right. How many times, again, you might not know this, but okay. How many times were Jacob's wages changed? Ten. Ten. God was testing his heart. How many days was Daniel tested? Ten. How many virgins were tested in Matthew 25? Ten. How many days of testing are mentioned in Revelation? Ten. How many disciples were there? No, there were 12. I was just testing you. I was just just testing you. So tithing is a test. And but here's something that you might not know. It's a two-way test. God not only tests you, but this is the only place in Scripture that I've found where God says, you can test me. Test me. This word try that is sometimes translated test or prove, uh, it comes from uh, the way you test a metal, the way you test gold to see if it's pure. You know what God is saying? Test me to see if I'm pure. Test me. I want you to. I want you to see because I want to open the windows of heaven. I want to bless you. I want to rebuke the devourer for you. But it depends on whether you're going to thank me and worship me and walk in faith and whether you're going to believe that 90% with God's blessing will go farther than 100% without. Yeah, so there is some great, great teaching here. Uh, I want to encourage you to, to find it if you haven't. Blessed Life, Pastor Robert Morris, you, you can watch it at, at length on your own. But uh, what he's saying is true. And so many of you who, who've begun that practice of tithing, or maybe you've practiced it for a long time in your life, you've seen over and over again how God is true and, and how God answers a person who gives in a regular and faithful way to him. And I just want to encourage you, if you've never taken that step, to take it. 
Um, there in your information racks, you, you may find a, a slip that says, a, a card that says 90-day tithe challenge. And the idea is we, we are so certain as a church that God will bless you if you begin tithing. We say, hey, if you'll tithe for 90 days, and if you say God doesn't bless you and you want your money back, we'll give you your money back. That's how certain we are about it. And whether you've taken, if you haven't taken that step, I want to encourage you, take it. Start Start giving in a structured way to God. It's not something churches just came up with. It's a principle that's throughout Scripture. I'm going to ask for the ushers at this time. They're going to come into place to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. As they come into place, uh, I just want to let, just want to make sure that you're aware of our, our missions banquet or missions dinner that's coming up on Saturday, November 2nd. Our speaker at our missions dinner this year will be Dr. Beth Grant. She is one of the founders of Project Rescue, which is an organization that's focused on freeing people from sexual slavery. And uh, you, you, you don't want to miss this dinner. For one, it's a $5 dinner. You can't get a $5 dinner, maybe at McDonald's, but then not with a soda. But you know what I'm saying. Uh, it, it is an, it's going to be a great dinner for 5 bucks. And you, you, will be, you will learn about things that you probably don't know very much about. So I just want to encourage you to come to learn, to be inspired, and just to be with the church. Tickets are for sale today in our lobby. And uh, so, so just be aware of that. Also, the last Sunday of this month is October 27th. And so you'll want to be sure um, to plan to, to get we're ready to show appreciation to our pastoral staff. I'm not included in this. I'll be participating with you in it in, in pastor appreciation offering. And so that's happening the last Sunday of this month. And uh, maybe, maybe you want to express appreciation to a particular pastor that you know well. And you can think about how to do that. Maybe it's through a card or, or some other way. But I want to encourage you, come and plan to be a part of that offering, which we will give to our pastors. Uh, they deserve our appreciation and 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 our our honor and that's what really that's about let's take a moment right now to pray as we give father we thank you for this chance to give to you and we we just uh surrender our uh, not only these gifts to you but we surrender our hearts to you i pray that for each person who is giving or maybe learning to give right now i just pray that you'll show us and give us an awareness that you answer back with, with all kinds of positive reinforcement when we will trust you in giving. God, for some of us, we've never taken that step because we've allowed for fear to hold us back. Put faith in our hearts to be generous people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Approaching the message today, we are continuing a second week of a series called Legacy, where I want to talk to you about how to live a life that, that, that lives beyond you. And um, as, we, as we get into that, I just want to say a big hello to those that are joining us in, in West Lafayette, to those joining us online, and uh, we, we're glad that you're with us today. Would you help me to welcome those folks right now? Yeah. West Lafayette, they are about a year old, turned a year old last month, and last month, uh, they, had, they had something like 12 connection cards turned in. That, that represents usually 12 families, who, new families who, who visited them during that month, and I, I just, just want you to know I'm glad to see what's happening uh, over there at Westside Campus. As we get going today, um, 
uh, on this subject of legacy, I just want to revisit kind of the big idea of this series, and that's this. Our big idea is that the goal of life isn't to live on earth forever, but to leave something that outlasts you. The goal of life isn't to live on earth forever, but to leave something that outlasts you. Now, as a church, we, we want to leave an impact in the lives of people. We want to leave a legacy in people's lives that outlasts us. So as a church, we want to see everybody take four steps. And those four steps are these. We want to see everyone come to know God. We believe that is the transformational event for every person uh, to come to. When they, when they come to know God through Jesus Christ, everything changes. We want to see everyone know God. Second, we want to see everyone discover purpose. Or, I'm sorry, we want to see everyone find freedom. Uh, and and, and by, by finding freedom, what I'm talking about here is all of us, every single one of us, have things about us that we need to have healed or fixed or we need to be freed from. And, and one of the best ways for us to find freedom is to get into relationship with other people who, who believe in Jesus Christ and to be able to share our lives and to be able to care for each other. When that happens, we'll find freedom. A third step we want to see every person take is to discover purpose. I knew it was coming somewhere. Uh, to discover purpose. And that is, we, we think that that every person, because the Bible says this, is, is wired with a purpose for which God created them, and that one of, the most, um, one of the most transformative events beyond knowing God in your life is figuring out why you're here. And so we want to help you to discover your purpose. That's why we offer the growth track. That's why I talk about it all the time, because we want to see you discover your purpose. And we do that by helping you to learn more about your spiritual gifts, more, learn more about your, your temperament. And then as you figure out what your purpose is, you'll get, you'll, you'll get involved in serving some way. You'll join our dream team. The dream team is a group of people here who in so many different ways make this church happen, make all its ministries happen. And we think that if all of us will take the steps to know God and find freedom and discover our purpose and get engaged with that purpose, that we will make waves. That is to say, we will make a difference. We'll see, we'll see waves of people be, be changed by God's love. And, and, and in fact, these, these four steps here, we, we, want, we, we see that all of them are important. This step here, making waves, that is the thing that is most closely related to legacy. Because, because this is the question, you know, what, what difference are you going to make with your life? What difference will there be that you were here? That you believed the things that you did? That you did the things that you did? That you, that you spent your treasure and your energy and your talents on the things that you did? What difference will there be? And, and this, this is really a key theme in Scripture. Look at it. In, in Genesis chapter 12, God comes to Abraham, the father of the Jews, right? And he not only tells him that he's going to bless him, look what he says, I'll make you a great nation, I'll bless you and make your name great. And why is he going to do those things? So that you will be a blessing. And this is a, a theme that's repeated over and over and over to the people of God in the Bible. We are not only supposed to receive blessing, but our lives are meant to be a blessing to others. That's what legacy is. And I'd say this, you know, you, you may have problems in your life. You may have points of unhappiness. You may have, like, so some negative things going on in your life. And if you are not clear about your purpose, if you're not clear about your legacy and the legacy you want to leave behind, those negative challenges you have, those pains that you have, those incomplete things about you maybe, or maybe like those things that you look at and you just, 
you're just obsessed with the, that, those negative spots in your life, those things will direct your life. Those things, unfortunately, if you are, if you are just focused on your problems, that will, is what will lead your life. And I'm wanting to encourage you through this series to say, you know what? If you will get focused on what your purpose is, if you'll get focused on what, your, what, your, what difference your life is meant to make, then your legacy can be the leading thing in your life. Not your negative challenges or your negative emotions. By legacy, what am I talking about? I'm talking about, by le- when I talk about legacy, I'm talking about things where your life lives on. Maybe it lives on in other people. Maybe it lives on through things you created or things you built. Legacy has to do with your life living on. Legacy has to do with giving to something that will outlive me. So your life can't just be about the next spring break trip you're going to take. It can't be about what you're going to buy for Christmas. It can't just be about those things. It's got to be about something more. When I talk about When I talk about legacy, what what I'm thinking about is living so my life outlasts me. Living so my life outlasts me. For many of us, we we can't seem to get beyond thinking about today and its, its demands of us. The Bible consistently points us to look ahead, to think about what is the result of our lives. You know, I, I want to I talk to you in this series about how, how to leave a legacy. Because the Bible is filled with this concept. I want for our church to be focused on our legacy, what it is that we're leaving behind in the lives of people. You know, I'm a pastor. The word pastor, the most basic definition or equivalent is shepherd. And a shepherd, I, I'm, as a shepherd, I'm wanting to shepherd you toward eternity, certainly. But I'm also wanting really to give you, to guide you, to make you ready for eternity now in how you live. That's why I'm talking to you about legacy. Romans 14 talks to us about the future, talks to us about a judgment that's coming It says, we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. That's why legacy matters. Because eventually, for you and me, there's going to be a review of our lives. And the question is, what, what does that judgment look like? Judgment, the judgment, you might think of it as a test. I'm, I, I've, I've told you before, I am horrible at math. Maybe, maybe math is your thing. Uh, languages are my thing. English is my thing. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do math very well. And I can remember one, one of my main problems with math is I can never explain how I got the answer. So like when I took algebra, you're supposed to like explain the process and I would just say like X equals 6, Y equals 15. I would give all the answers and my answer was right. And my teacher said, you get an F because even though your answer is right, I can never understand how you got the answer and you've got to tell me. I thought that was so unfair that I took the class again took the algebra twice in eternity with these with these judgments that are coming really there are two questions of eternity and the first question is what did you do with Jesus what did you do with Jesus that's that's really the key question of your life and if you don't know if you don't know Jesus, if you don't really have a relationship with him and you don't live for him 
And you can't answer this question by saying, well, I knew him, I gave my life to him. Then you're going to fail. The judgment of God is going to be something you won't be able to pass because the only right answer is here to say, I knew him. I knew him. Now, in, in the Bible, there are two different judgments that are mentioned. One is the great white throne judgment. It's, it's a judgment that's just kind of asking who's, who's with Jesus and who's not. It's explained in Revelation chapter 20. It says, I saw the great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. So God is so big and so powerful and so full of glory that when he comes on the scene, the earth and all the stars move out of his way. And I saw the dead, great and small. Just in case you're wondering, almost everyone who's listening, including me, is small. We, we fit on this side of the equation. And he says, they were great and small, and they were standing before this great white throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. So there's, there were some books that were opened that were basically all of the people who were not going to make it into heaven. And then there was one book of life, where the people who came to believe in Jesus and, and trust him, give their life to him, where, that's where their names were found. It says the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So that's, that's, a, that's a picture of this first question. That's the first judgment. And, you know, if you don't know Jesus, this is the question that you really, that's the only question that matters for you right now. It's the most important question for you to come to be able to answer. But the second question that we're asked in judgment is this. There's a second judgment. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And, it, and at the judgment seat of Christ, we're basically asked this question. What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with everything that I put in your life? You know, 2 Corinthians 5.10, it, it kind of describes this judgment seat of Christ event in this way. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And so, and so something uh, is going to be given to every believer in Christ at this judgment seat of Christ. Because God, God is a rewarder. God, God gives us something back for what we've done. And then, if you'll, if you'll look, Jesus talks, Jesus talks about it like this. He says in Matthew 16, the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory and with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what He has done. You might wonder why I'm talking to you about legacy. It's because your life and my life is going to be scrutinized by God. There are rewards that are in play here. And, and there can be loss. Now you might be confused. You might think, well, wait a second, you know, I thought heaven is free and, and Christ's death is, is it, my, my salvation is, is by grace and faith and all that. What are you saying? I, I'm, I'm not saying anything different from that. But what I am also saying is it profoundly matters how you live. It matters how you spent your time. It matters how you spent your relationships. It matters how you spent your talents and opportunities. It matters how you spent your money. You can't earn heaven. But the right answer to this question, what did you do with the stuff I gave you? The right answer is, well, Lord, I gave my life away. I gave my life away. Before Jesus, your whole life is about finding Jesus. But once you find Jesus, then the, the, the whole point of your life becomes about making a difference for Jesus. That's legacy. The whole point of your life is about, 
is about making a difference for Jesus in the time that we have on earth. There, there are just scores and scores of verses about this. And today I want to talk to you about how you can leave a legacy. But I just want you to see something else the Bible says about you and me, about our hearts. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. So that is to say, we, we all have woven into our hearts the sense that we want to live forever and the sense that we want for our lives to matter forever. That's what legacy is about. And so, so how is it that we can become people who, who leave a legacy that matters? So I, I have some thoughts about this. I think there are three basic commitments. You get started on these things you'll begin to live a legacy life. You'll start to create a legacy out of your life that matters, that lasts forever, that makes a difference in other people's lives. They may not be the kinds of things that you think of automatically, but trust me, these are key areas. First of all, the the first commitment of a legacy life is I will intentionally give what I have. I will intentionally give what I have. You know what? I'm not suggesting that you give what you don't have. In fact, you you can't give what you don't have. God won't hold you accountable for what you don't have. And I'm not just talking here about your money. I'm talking about you. You've got breath. You got got thumbs. You can can text to somebody if you're a two-thumbing texter. You can encourage them. You've you've got 2019. Think about the generations before us that didn't have what we have with respect to technology. And the best we can do is like post a picture of our cheeseburger. we've We've got incredible opportunities to give. Look at what we have. I want to suggest something to you that, that many of you probably won't believe me, but I just want you to recognize this is what's true. I've traveled all over the world, and I could say this with confidence. Every person here today, you're a rich person. You're a rich person in comparison to the rest of the world. And look what the scriptures say about rich people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. That's why you have been blessed in the way that you have. You've been made rich with the capacity, as I said, to to encourage others. You've been made rich with the capacity to smile at others and make them feel better about their day. You have time. You have money. You have houses. You have cars. You've got probably great health. Your generosity could result in people knowing God. He says, he says, and through, your, through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. That's what can come from generosity. But I've been saying here, I'm saying in this point is, my, what I'm saying is the first commitment of a, of a legacy life is to give intentionally. I said earlier that many of us, we don't give, or I'm sorry, I said many of us live out of our negative emotions. We live out of and follow around the worst things that have ever happened to us or been said to us. We let our fears direct our lives. We let our losses direct our lives. And I'm saying to you that if you just depend on your emotions to direct whether or not you're going to give, You'll never give in a significant way. Today, oh, you might say, hey, today, you know, I can, I, I, feel, I feel like I could afford to be generous. That's not where true, lasting, regular generosity comes from. Regular generosity comes from an intention, an intentionality when it comes to giving. And I'm saying to you, make a commitment 
to give intentionally. How can you do that? What are some things you can do? Well, first of all, I want to say to you, become a percentage giver. And that is, that is partly why I'm, I, I show this clip today about, about, about tithing, because I want you to understand that, <coughs> that that's, a, that's a biblical concept, that's a God concept being a percentage giver. But I'm saying to you, don't, don't let how you feel dictate what you give. Don't say to yourself, I think I could afford X, but make a decision ahead of time to figure out what it is that you can give, what it is that you're, you, you, you need to live on, what percentage you could give back to God, and as your income grows, continue to give, and you will steadily develop a legacy of generosity. But if you allow your emotional self to direct what you give, it, it will never grow, it will never become significant. And that's why God gives us the favor of starting at 10%. Many of us, we give 10%. But we could give more. And that's why I'm saying to you, become a percentage giver. Don't limit it. Maybe you look at what comes into your life and you recognize you could give much more than you do. Don't stop there. A legacy person is a percentage giver and lets it grow. A second step you can take in terms of becoming a person who gives intentionally is to set goals for giving. So maybe by the end of the year, you're, gonna, you're, you're thinking about how you're going to give significantly to God and others. So like right now, we're, we're approaching the end of yet another year. 2019 is coming to an end. Maybe you need to like go back and figure out what you've given so far in 2019 and say to yourself, Lord, what, what can I give in the next few months? Before the end of the year, what goal could I set to give to my church, to give to missions, to give to a cause that I care about, to give to someone who I know is in need? The way that you can become an intentional giver is to set some goals. My wife called me out of the blue this summer. She was thinking about Christmas. I wasn't there yet. And she said, I think maybe this Christmas should be different. She said, I, I think maybe this Christmas we should take that money that we spend on Christmas and use it in different ways. Maybe give to some people who are in need. That's what I mean. She's thinking about what she can give. And, and you need to do the same thing. Take some time to set some goals your giving. It doesn't matter maybe that you don't feel like you have a lot. Start with the percentage and then set some goals about what you're going to do. Third, a third step you can take in becoming an intentional giver is, is to take the act of kindness card we're going to give you on the way out today. We used these a couple years ago. We're going we're gonna to pass them out again because the idea is you, you're going to get a card that says God loves you, and it, it just kind of like invites people to church, and it also lets people know you're, you're doing something kind for them because of God's love in your life and in their life. And so you could use that card in a variety of ways. You could, you could, you could go and bless a server today at lunch with an extra generous tip. Leave them the card. Now listen, don't leave the card as the tip. You hear what I'm saying? got our church's name on it don't do that but but or, or maybe it's that you want to pay for somebody else's meal maybe it's that you want to be be kind to someone and you want to help a, a neighbor with a project they've been working on by themselves or or maybe like you could take that card and you could you could give it to a young mom in your neighborhood who you know is alone with her kids every single day and she she could really use some free time some time without her kids and so you're going to go there you're going to give her the card. You're going to say, hey, just take off for a few hours. I'm going to take care of your kids. But whatever the case is, figure out a way that, that, that you're going to be kind intentionally. That's why we give out these cards. A second step you can take, a second commitment of, 
of a legacy life is this, I will intentionally serve others. Again, if you just wait until you're ready to feel like you want to serve others, you likely will never create a legacy of serving others. It's got to be worked systematically, purposefully into your life. Now, some of you, you're here at this church and you're, you're kind of new. Maybe you were really involved at the last church you were at. And so you've, you're saying, hey, you know, I need to take a break. I just need to enjoy this church for a little bit. That's fine. That's fine. But if you've been here for a while, if this is your spiritual home, then it's time for you to get on the team. It's time for you to get in a group. It's time for you to find a way to serve here. If you're going to be a legacy person, you've got to serve. Why is that? It's the model Jesus gave us. Look at Matthew 25. Jesus tells a story about judgment. And he says that at the end of time, he's going to separate some people and he's going to, he's going to bless them for the way that they were a blessing. And he's, he says the king's going to gather these people together and he's going to say, I was hungry and you gave me food. They served. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. They served. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. They served. I was, I was naked, and you clothed me. They served. I was sick, and you visited me. They served. I was in prison, and you came to me. They served. And these people, they're, they're going to look at each other and be like, Lord, well, king, when did we ever see you in need and, and give to you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. What's Jesus wanting us to understand? He's wanting us to understand that even when we serve, uh, even when we serve people who, who in no way can ever pay us back, they can never, they, they can never uh, give us the favor back. When we serve people, Somehow we're serving Jesus. And whenever we serve Jesus, it's something that lasts forever. It's something that outlasts us. And so I'm saying to you, you want to be a legacy person? Then you better intentionally figure out how it is that you're going to serve others. Because you're going to be called to account for it. A way that you can serve here is through our dream team. The dream team is all those people in our church who make our ministries happen. There's a dream team on Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning, they're playing instruments, they're running cameras, they're, they're ushers, they're greeters, they're, they're, they're working in children's ministry. They're, they're making the church happen. That's our dream team. Our dream team serves in a variety of ways. And I'm saying to you, you want to have a legacy that outlasts you? Join our dream team. The way you get onto the dream team is you go to that growth track that we talk about each Sunday. You figure out what your gifts are, you learn about the opportunities, are, what they are, and you step into it. Some other ways that you can serve others that, that are right here intentionally, you can do outreach with our community center twice a month on Thursdays. They serve Hungry people through our food pantry. Celebrate Recovery starts later this month. They still need people who will serve in that ministry to make it happen for those that are going to come to them looking for help with their issues. Maybe, maybe you, you think of River of Hope. Maybe that's something you could do at the community center. That is a, that, that is a, a, a grief support ministry that's helping people ages 4, through adult, it starts this week. Maybe you could go there and you could serve in some meaningful way that makes a difference for people who are looking for direction and healing on the inside. Maybe you could lead a life group. Maybe you could, maybe you could serve in our holiday outreaches. I don't know what you can do, but I'm saying you want to become a person of legacy, you want to have your life matter, then you need to intentionally set about serving others in a consistent way so that you can develop a legacy of serving. The last way that you can, you can become a legacy person, a third commitment of a legacy life, 
is I will intentionally share Christ. I'll intentionally share Christ. Why am I saying this? Because a lot of Sundays here, they're about you. I get it. You need to grow. You need to worship. You, you need to listen to the Word of God for you. But there ought to at least be two Sundays a year, just two, where you bring someone with you who, who's unchurched. There ought to be some times during the year when you bring someone with you who you know doesn't really know Christ or they're far from Him. I've had people walk up to me in church and they'll say things like, you know, I've got a friend here today, so please don't blow it. And I'll be like, okay, I, I'll try that. Uh, when you bring someone here, in the end, you'll, that, that will give you the opportunity to share Christ. When you see that person you've brought make a commitment to Christ, it will... It, it will change, revolutionize purpose and your sense of legacy in your life. But in order to get to that place, to see people you know receive Christ for themselves, you've got to begin to intentionally share Christ. Intentionally invite people. Intentionally find, a, find ways to talk to people about the difference that Jesus has made in your life. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are Christ's ambassadors, you and me. God is making his appeal through us. That's, that's, what, that, that's what God wants. God wants to express himself and his love for others through us. If we're going to live up to this, we've got to, we've got to get busy to, in, in sharing Christ intentionally. Do we want this place full? Do you want it full here? Some of you aren't certain. Do you want this place full with people? Yeah. Well, you know how we get it full? It's by inviting others. It's by sharing. Every study that's out there will tell you that, that the average person who doesn't go to church will say yes if they're invited by someone. So invite them. You might think, not the people I know, I'm telling you, massive studies, a lot of them out there, they all say the same thing. The problem is the average person who comes to church doesn't think to invite others. You want to become a person of legacy, start inviting others in. Why am I talking to you about this? Why am I focused on legacy this month? It's because of the Bible, it, it tells me to do this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, written to a young church leader by Paul. He's writing to Timothy and he says, Command those who are rich, I've said to you, you're all rich. Rich in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. That's legacy. And be generous and willing to share. And he says, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Why am I wanting you to become an incredible person of, of, of legacy who who gives and who serves and who shares with intentionality, it's because a judgment is coming. And it's my charge as your pastor to make sure that you're preparing the very best you can for it. Bottom line today is this. There is more to this life than this life. I've given you some real practical steps to being sure that this life is one where you're leaving a legacy that matters.